This is Smart Poker Study episode 222, making more double barrel bluff C-bets. In last week's episode number 221, I answered your questions with actions that you must take right now to improve your post-flop play and reactions to losing big money. It's poker study time, y'all. Thank you so much for sharing the show. I do appreciate it. You know, I know that word of mouth, it's probably the best way to spread the word. But those tweets and those Facebook shares, uh, oh, retweets, of course, as well. Those help for show. So thank you very much for those. And make sure you're subscribed to my YouTube channel, which is simply Smart Poker Study. Uh, and you want to be subscribed because every day this week, I've been dropping a new coaching video. Monday through Friday, I put out the complete five-part coaching series, where I helped our listener Julio find and plug some leaks. He was the contest winner from a few weeks back, if you remember that. And on Saturday and Sunday, I'm releasing two more episodes of the 5-Minute Poker Coach. Alrighty, one quick shout-out before we get to the double-barreling action. John Crowell is my latest insider on Patreon. He decided to support me every month uh, in, I guess, you know, probably in appreciation for this podcast. So thank you very much, John. You appreciate what I do, and I really appreciate the support that you are giving me. If you want to follow in John's footsteps, go to patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy. There are different levels of support with different rewards attached. And just two days ago, I put out the February podcast um, for Patreon supporters. And yesterday, I put out the Patreon training video. So those are right there for you to check out. Once you start your uh, once you start your support, you'll have access to that patron-only content. So just go to patreon.com slash smartpokerstudy to start your support. Cool beans, let's get to double barrels. So I received a question uh, from Mark via email, and here's what he asked. He said, I am way too turn honest because my C-bet drops from 71% on the flop to 36% on the turn. I know that I need to double barrel C-bet more frequently, but I never know when the right time is. Help me to double barrel more often. Alrighty, and I thought this was a perfect topic. I mean, Mark emailed this at exactly the right time because February is the month of post-flop. And this is one of those post-flop strategies or post-flop skills that a ton of players want to develop. And not just want to develop, you need to develop this double barrel uh, ability, you know? So let's get to it. Challenge. Here's my challenge to you for this episode. Over the next two weeks or 10,000 hands, Practice your double barrel bluff C bending. You should have plenty of opportunities to do so because you are a bread and butter player with most flops giving you the opportunity to C bet. Start by planning your flop C bets and your turn double barrels on the flop. Before you bluff on the flop, ask and answer the question Will my bet get them to fold? If not, ask yourself Will they fold to a double barrel? If the answer to both of these is no, then skip the flop c-bet bluff. But if either answer is a yes, pull the trigger on your one or two street bluff. Before you do the two streets, the double barrel, ask yourself if the turn card helps or hurts your opponent's range. If it hurts their range, highly consider barreling. Utilize their fold to c-bet stats your position, their range and board interaction, as well as good bet sizing to earn the folds you're looking for. Now it's your turn to pull the trigger and scooby dooby do something positive for your poker game. You better wake up. The world you live in is just a sugar-coated topping. There is another world beneath it, the real world. And if you want to survive it, you better learn to pull the trigger. So if you stop the podcast right now and just complete that challenge, you will have done your purposeful study and practice for the next three days. But for those who want to learn a little bit more about double barreling, please stick around. And of course, visit the show notes page for everything I discussed today, along with screenshots and links at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod222. And while you're there, sign up for the weekly boost for exclusive poker strategy direct to your inbox. It's time, Gambate! Alrighty then. 
there are two reasons why we want to increase our double barrel frequency. The first reason is that double barrels earn more chips. And the second reason? Double barrels remove an easy way for our opponents to exploit us. I'll discuss how they earn us more chips first. So double barrel bets earn us more chips in one of two ways. We either take that pot down pre-showdown or we earn extra value. Let me discuss uh, taking the pot down early. When we double barrel the turn, we're playing aggressive poker and we're applying pressure to our opponents for a third time. Remember, you were the preflop raiser, you c-bet on the flop, and now you're c-betting on the turn. This can make it difficult for foldy players like nits and tags to stay in beyond your barrel. These players hate putting in too much money without a great hand, so they're often going to fold their weaker than top pair hands. You can even bet big enough to make it too expensive for them to chase their open end straight draws and their flush draws. Maybe not their nut flush draws, but most of their flush draws they can fold if that double barrel is big enough. And be careful when you're bluffing those fish and loose aggressive players. They don't fold easily, so it might take a larger sizing, paired with position, as well as a good turn card, to get them to fold. The most important question you can ask when you're making any type of bluff is, will my bet get them to fold? The answer to this question will guide you to the correct play. And remember my favorite saying, if they ain't folding, you ain't bluffing. The second way that double barrels earn more chips is by earning just extra value. They do this when we have our strongest hands. First, we, we're building the pot with a hand that's likely to win at showdown. Second, if our opponents know that we're capable of those multi-street bluffs, Maybe they were paying attention to prior hands, or they've seen it showdown that we bluffed with a flush draw or something. These players are going to be less likely to believe us in the future. This allows our flopped sets and turned straights or rivered flushes to gain more value because of the prior deception that we've shown. The best opponents to gain value from are the loose passive calling stations, or we call them fish. Loose aggressive players can also give us value, and sometimes they even come in for raises and bluff raises with subpar hands. The bottom line is, if they are willing to pay, either because of their hand strength or they hate giving up, then double barreling is essential to get the most from your best hands. Now, here's the second reason we want to increase our double barrels. It's because they avoid an easy exploit. In the question that sparked this episode, Mark said his stats are 71% c-bet on the flop and 36% c-bet on the turn. He is way too turn honest. Our knowledgeable opponents have an easy way to take advantage of Mark's turn honesty. They exploit him by calling every flop c-bet and as soon as he checks the turn, they bet at the next opportunity. By double barreling instead and showing a third instance of aggression like this, if they want to bluff you now, it's going to take an expensive raise or an expensive river bet in a bloated pot after they call that turn bet. Either way, it's costly to bluff against a double barrel, so a lot of players are going to fold because they expect you to double barrel because they're looking at your stats. If Mark increases his turn c-bet to 55% and maybe decreases his flop c-bet to 65%, he's going to make it so much harder for opponents to bluff him off of pots. All right, so how can we find more double barrel opportunities? It can be really scary to put more chips in the pot as a double barrel bluff. And that's one of the reasons why we don't double barrel bluff enough. So becoming a good double barrel bluffer, it's going to take some practice. You're going to have to complete today's challenge and actively look for good, positive EV opportunities to throw out the turn bluff. As you're practicing on the felt, I want you to consider these next four factors before every bluff, and if you do so, your decisions are going to be improved and you'll feel much more comfortable with your double barrel bluffs. Factor number one is the opponent you're up against and their stats. As mentioned earlier, foldy players are the best ones for bluffing, so be more willing to attempt bluffs against nits and tags. Make sure to look at your opponent's fold to flop c-bet and fold to turn c-bet stats. Anything over 60% is good on either street. For those double barrels, it's particularly good to see a high fold to turn c-bet stat 
even if their fold to flop c-bet stat is low. These players are turn honest against c-bets, so take advantage of that. If they fold a lot on the flop, but not the turn, be less inclined to double barrel bluff. They already made their decision on the flop, so because they called, they like their hand and they're less likely to fold on the turn. And the number of opponents is important. It's easier to bluff when you are heads up, so use those opportunities to pull off more double barrel bluffs. All right, the second factor to consider when you are double barrel bluffing is position. Bluffing, of course, it's easier when you're in position. Positionally aware opponents whose fold to c-bet is higher when they're out of position are great targets. The third factor is sizing. The larger you go, the more likely they're going to fold. Half pot doesn't get folds as often as two-thirds or three-quarter pot bets. You're going to have to test out different bet sizings to see what works in your games. And last but not least is factor number four, the board. So the drier the board, which means it's hard to hit strong hands and good draws, the easier it is to bluff at. A board like queen, eight, three, deuce, rainbow, or 10, 10, four, seven, or ace, king, seven, three, rainbow. They are tougher for those calling ranges to hit. So utilize those for your flop and turn c-bet bluffs. So you're looking for ace high and king high boards to bluff on. Also, paired boards are good along with rainbow boards because they offer only straight draws. And the drier the board, the more fold equity your bluffs have. Also, when you double barrel bluff, look for turn cards that do not help your opponent's range. You don't want to double barrel on cards that make the board scarier, like that third spade or four to the straight. They have lots of draws in their flop calling range. So when you bet on the turn, when the turn card completes a few different draws, their range is actually strengthened, not yours. So they're folding less often. Conversely, the wetter the board, the less likely they're going to fold in general on the flop or on the turn. Beware of boards that offer tons of draws and pairs to your opponent's calling range. Scary boards to bluff are like Jack-10-8-6 with two spades, or 8-7-6 deuce with two clubs, or even any board with three clubs on it, right? These boards are easy for calling ranges to hit with tons of made hands like two pairs, sets, and straights, and they also have a ton of flush draws, straight draws, and even pair plus, plus draws, right? If somebody's holding 10 of spades, 9 of spades on the Jack-10-8-6 board with two spades, they have a pair. They have an open and a straight draw, plus they have a flush draw. You are never getting this hand to fold. Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. And of course, they have my three books, How to Study Poker Volume 1, Volume 2, and my latest book, Preflop Online Poker. Here's what I recommend. Sign up for your free trial at audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy. Get How to Study Poker Volume 1 as your first free book. Study that, and with your very next month and your next free book, get Preflop Online Poker. The fact that you studied How to Study Poker Volume 1, that's going to help you get more out of Preflop Online Poker. So once again, visit audibletrial.com slash smartpokerstudy to start your audiobook learning. And a few shout outs today. This was a good week this past week. Daniel Majan and Tony both purchased Poker Tracker 4 through my affiliate link. You can get, uh, or you could click the link in the show notes page to do the exact same thing because of their support. I really do appreciate that, of course. So I sent them my Smart HUD as a free gift. Thank you very much, Daniel and Tony. Speaking of the Smart HUD, Dennis Steele purchased that directly from me by going to smartpokerstudy.com slash smart HUD. That smart HUD has 16 stats on it, as well as six personalized pop-ups to help Dennis, Daniel, and Tony, and everybody else destroy their opponents, utilizing Poker Tracker 4 and that smart HUD, of course. So thank you very much, guys, for that support. And this past week, we had a few webinar purchases. 
Barry Cole picked up Poker's Bread and Butter webinar. That was the most recent one that I held last month. It was the January webinar. And Vidar Sorensen picked up the Poker Tracker 4 webinar. He is using it to get the most out of Poker Tracker 4. And Barry Cole, of course, is putting himself into more post flop bread and butter situations. So if you want either one of these uh, webinars for yourself, just go to the show notes page. And lastly, MC Divot purchased How to Study Poker Volume 1 and Volume 2 in PDF form from my website. Alrighty, back to class, poker people. So if you're double barreling more frequently, you're giving players more opportunities to raise you. So first, it's important to realize that Raises on later streets, they're often signs of great strength. The more passive or straightforward your opponent is, the more weight you should give their raises. If you don't know anything about the player, like you've only got 30 hands on them and you've never seen a showdown, you should tend to believe 95% of their turn and river raises. They are doing this with two pair or greater hands. You really only want to put bluffs in your opponent's raising range if you've seen them bluff before. The most important thing you can do when you face a raise after you double barrel bluff is to answer this question. What are they raising with? Because, like I said, most raises are for value, you're going to answer this question with something like, they're raising their two pair of greater hands, or you're going to say, they're raising only their flushes on this board. So because your double barrel was a bluff, you're going to have to fold most of the time versus these stronger hands. Just get used to it and start clicking that fold button after you do the double barrel. But if you answer that prior question and you figure that they do have bluffs and draws and weak hands in their range, then of course you cannot call because you were bluffing yourself. You have to either fold or 3-bet re-bluff them. If you do decide to re-bluff them with a 3-bet on the turn, you must be extremely sure that they can fold because at this point, the pot is probably 60 big blinds or more. And this can cause many players to stay in just because they've already invested 30 big blinds and they just do not want to fold any of their kinds of draws. Alrighty, the last thing to talk about is improving your double barrels off the felt. And how are you going to do this? It's going to take hand reading exercises. Once per day, during your study session, or even as a pre-session warm-up, that's where I like to do my hand reading, hand reading exercises, pull up one hand in your database where you had the opportunity to double barrel and the hand went to showdown. Whether you made the double barrel or not doesn't really matter. Your goal with these hand reading exercises is to get very familiar with your opponent's pre-flop calling ranges and what they tend to call on the flop and turn with and what they raise you with. This is going to help you develop an intuitive grasp of c-betting and double barreling situations, and it will allow you to make more positive EV bluffs and value bets at the tables. And if you go to the show notes page for today, remember smartpokerstudy.com slash pod222, you're going to find two double barrel related hand reading videos there. Watch both of those to see the kind of questions I ask myself, to see the kind of things I think about as I'm doing my hand reading, utilizing a hand from my database and Flopzilla. Well, this episode is not complete until you head to the show notes page at www.smartpokerstudy.com slash pod222. Go there for screenshots and links to everything I discussed today and to discover ways in which you can support the podcast to keep me keeping on. Thank you so much for listening today. Make sure you step into action with today's challenge if you want to get the most out of this episode. Please leave a review for the show on your favorite podcatching app. Other than word of mouth, this is the best way to help the show grow. And of course, if you have a question, send them on in, sky at smartpokerstudy.com. Alrighty, poker people, in the next Strategy Friday episode number 223, I'm going to give you a little bit more post-flop action goodness. Word of mouth is the best advertising, so thank you very much for sharing the show with other poker people. Your sharing and caring is what helps us grow. Until next time, study smart, play much, and make your next session the best one yet.